Og så har jeg to hatter i dag, og så er jeg også programansvarlig um, over for en af programmerne. And uh, on that effect, I'll change languages, if that's okay with everybody, if, since the program is in English. So, again, my name is David Garcia, and I'm also director of Architecture and Extreme Environments, which you possibly have heard of. Um, I uh, have the pleasure of running this program together with Jacob Knudsen, Marianne Hansen, and Thomas Boistrup, and uh, more uh, every year in close collaboration with Emanuele Laboni and Daniel Lee as the intricate part of the research uh, body uh, of the program. And uh, next year, uh, we'll be including uh, Karina Moser, given the fact that we're going to have a special option into the program, which I'll be talking to you in about a second. I always like to start with this animation because I think it, it's very revealing. This is the Anthropocene. This is everything that we have built in the world without the Earth in it. That is how far we have spread our work. That is how far our cities have spread out. And obviously, when there is a challenge, they meet it head on. Because very often, we've just continued the way that we've been building for the past century. Haven't uh, changed much about how we relate to architecture and its challenges. And uh, densification, for example, close to coastal areas, has a larger impact. So we're interested in climate change, but especially in climate impact. How does it impact our cities? Health in buildings, that's a crucial aspect in contemporary megalopolis in the uh, developed world, but also everywhere else. Um, materials and their origin, their circular economy, where do they come from? Do they really have to be brought from the other end of the world every single time? pollution and how can we deal with that, which obviously syncs very well with the uh, UN Sustainable Development Goals, which we've been dealing for a while, but it's an added addition uh, to the focus of the school. Nonetheless, there are some, I would say, primal questions that we would like to ask ourselves. For example, how can architecture deal with these future challenges in a sustainable manner? And every time I look at a building, I say, how can we do this? And how can this type of construction do more? If we really look at this building, All we've become really good at is actually controlling the environment inside in a better and better way. But we have tens of thousands of square meters exposed to the outside, which are still doing nothing. It is just keeping the air and the temperature and the water out. We think that it's about time that that is taken as a serious challenge in the realm of architecture. So in extreme environments, we like to engage with world challenges by working there, not from the distance of your desk, but by going there and getting your hands dirty. We want to explore how architecture can be proactive instead of a passive resource user. We want to collaborate with other disciplines and researchers towards a site-specific architecture that draws resources locally and efficiently, and to critically work with technology and performance to inv while investigating new artistic expressions. And this one is crucial for us. We're not engineers, and we don't want to be engineers. We think that the more that we know how architecture and technology can work together, the more that we can draw artistic and design potential from those gestures. There are design and artistic universes to be discovered once you go into these aspects. And those are crucial for the world of architecture. That is why we go to the end of the world. Not to study these things from here, but to immerse ourselves in those extreme conditions which are very often out of balance. So how is this course structured? Well, we have a first semester. Uh, fourth and fifth years collaborate all the time because we want to raise the fourth years to the expectations of fifth years. That means that when they meet the thesis project, they've almost already gone through it. They're working together and the expectations are the same for everybody. The first semester is, uh, deals with information gathering, prototyping and making and expedition field work that allows you to develop a program, an architectural program that is then developed in the second semester. And we have artistic practice and research elements that go through the courses, uh, through the year and the two semesters. Now, there's something new, which is that this year, if your development of a prototype seems to be fascinating enough for you, you're welcome to develop that 
as the second semester instead of a building, and we'll talk more about that. How is this course structured? Well, first, investigation, being informed. Before we go there, we research on uh, demographic aspects, uh, um, energy, uh, history, um, urbanistic aspects of the place we're going to be visiting, energy, power, and pollution, and all these facts are gathered by you. You're taught to how to sort through the facts that are available today, how to go to resources that are um, reliable, but also then to curate it and be able to present the work so it's understandable and aesthetically at attracting. I mean, that's crucial because part of your work as an architect is going to be about communicating. In essence, you're never going to build anything, probably. All you're going to do is draw things that other people are going to be building or convince other people that your scheme is the best scheme to be built. So communication skills are crucial, how you draw, why you draw what you draw, and how you communicate from graphic to verbal presentations. And this creates a body of work that is available for all the students to draw information from before we go to our expedition. The second phase is about making, making with your hands, learning that things put together. It's amazing how we sometimes receive fifth-year students about to graduate, probably start engaging in building skyscrapers. They try to do a two-meter structure and it just falls apart 30 times. It's incredible. And the power of learning by doing things by hand is crucial. You not only draw, but when you draw, you know what the implications are. This is what it's about. You have a task, and I'm going to use Otis uh, as a project to say why is this relevant and how it works. So he was interested through his research in uh, the pollution levels in Lanzro, which was one of the most uh, polluted cities that we uh, visited in the Gobi expedition last year. He collaborated with these universities and suppliers to find out how can this be dealt, what are ways that we're using to deal with this, not only the traditional ones, but alternative ones. He discovered that plants are very active in cleaning our air, even more algae. So he engaged with creating algae systems that could take in air, and through a series of prototypes and sketches, devised a system that could be transportable, that could grow algae that, was, that came from the uh, local river, uh, there's a process of manufacture, which is crucial. Whatever you do has to be able to be transported, deployed in different places, shown to researchers, tested, and then assessed and, and the performance of your thesis. It's okay if it doesn't work, but at least you can test and figure out why it didn't work. You're going through an exploration process that is informed. It's not just maybe. You put a set of pits together and that is transportable and you learn how to use systems that can measure your thesis, that can measure your intentions and record those results. So whatever results are, you can present them. Now I'm going to show a very short film that kind of shows this project and I'll make some comments along. This is the Yellow River, again one of the most polluted rivers in China but it still has algae. Actually, algae blooms because of its pollution levels. He learned from biologists how to capture that algae and isolate it. He used very simple systems in a very sophisticated frame to be able to grow that algae. He had access to a laboratory while we were in China, collaborating with a university, so he could uh, leave his uh, uh, system and grow the algae. Sensors were telling him about pollution levels in Banjo. The system could also become a facade that can be placed inside or outside. Algae had bloomed, as you can see, it's green. Those bladders were filled. The pump was pumping air from the inside through the algae. And have a budget, you have a timeline, it has to be built and it takes off, you put a thesis to test. You know the that it has to be aesthetically and artistically engaged with the world. Once it is placed somewhere, it's not an engineer art. It is something that is talking to the world around you and engaging with the world, not just the curious. 
there is important, and the qualities of these elements are the way that you actually get ideas that can be groundbreaking to be tested. You are the ones that are going to make the new architecture of the future. Not me anymore, but you. So that is why we are there, and we test these things, we record its processes, we collaborate with people and industry and practice, we see how they build in this context, we see their problems at first hand, and we are informed by all of these elements to define the program, the building program that you take with you to define a building for the second semester. Now, how do you turn this into a building? What does all of this have to do with a building? So I'm going to go through a couple of examples to show you how this impacts a building. Gabriele was interested in malaria, health in the Amazon, uh, no access to medicine, no access to clinics. We went to the heart of the Amazon to study and meet with these communities. And she was interested in how different building elements, like nets, can still produce barriers between the mosquito and yourself, but still be used as architectural elements. So in her experiments and the collection of data, she found out that these communities were so far apart, it was impossible to create a single building that could allocate and give the services required. So the only solution was a floating clinic. This floating clinic was playing with traditional barge systems, but also with elastic and dynamic systems that could open up, build with different types of nets that would allow ventilation and air to go through, but per, uh, to keep away the mosquitoes and allow not only for treatment and curing, but also for educational purposes as it navigated through the rivers and met the community. Another example, Johan, also in the Amazon, was fascinated by the power of plants to control temperature. So he gathered apophytes, collaborating with biologists, found out that apophytes don't need soil. They're always growing up in trees and getting their nutrients from the air. He collected them, had this portable facade that he would test in the city, and discovered that it could lower the temperature by a substantial amount. So he used that as a way of saying, well, if this can lower the temperature, I have this challenge of one of the hottest places in Manaus, this almost kilometer-long bus station that was in the order of 55 degrees Celsius. It was impossible to stay there and wait for any bus. He reassessed its complexities in the city and to try to distribute its uh, flow of access by the different uh, routes, distributed around an area that was free, and started to see how plants and airflow could start to curate and lower the temperature, and hence the power of simulating your proposals. The fact that you're sketching, simulating, sketching, simulating is giving you a feedback if your ideas are actually manageable. And he was able to create an architecture defined by biology, not by traditional walls. Just by the growth of plants, seasonal plants, at different levels and different stages, in different areas and different zones, we're able to curate the temperature necessities and requirements in this bus station in the middle of Manaus. And Rob, who studied sewage, one of the biggest problems was also in Manaus, the accumulation of garbage and unfiltered sewage with his experiment in the first semester was able to curate where does these come from? Where are these pollutants come from? And what type of pollutants are they? They were from heavy drugs all the way to industrial products. And he was able then to generate a program that concentrated into how do we do a sewage system, a cleaning system for this river without creating an industry and an infrastructure that is not accessible and not giving anything back to the city. So, fascinated by the power of performance and theater of Brazil, he created these uh, sewage uh, cleaning plants that were also playing with the tide and were also acting as spaces for the public, for performance, for the playfulness of seeing the transformation of something that was useless into something that was clean. And this year, what we're actually, uh, we, what we're also uh, opening up for is your, if you're fascinated by the development of the first um, um, prototype, you can develop that prototype further. There's a great um, requirement and, uh, from the industry and manufacturers to also engage architects into defining the palette of materials that we're building today. That means that for example, people like Alexander, who developed salt filters in the Gobi, who end up uh, taking that further into facades made out of salt that could clean the air. Uh, Grace Chen's uh, dynamic uh, facade using humidity to literally open up and release air flows in Iceland could literally create facades that are dynamic. Or projects like uh, Gabrielis, who's developing a new brick system bound by uh, 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 bacteria, 
who has now been proposed, not only received a huge grant to take that on after her thesis, but also proposed the, po the possibility of engaging into a PhD afterwards, could take that on in the second semester. And that is up to you. If you want to do that, that is a possibility. All of this is parallel to what's crucial for us, which is critical thinking and research methodologies. Engaging with artistic practitioners and uh, researchers, it is crucial for us to engage in a syllabus and a theory essays that position your work theoretically. Most of you are great designers, but if I ask you how do you position your work in the history of ideas of the 21st century, you're suddenly very quiet. And it is crucial today to understand where ideas come from and how to situate your project. And that is why the written essay is dedicated towards that. Parallel to that, you're taught the environmental simulations, which equals informed design. And that's been an incredible success for all our thesis students. How to use measurements and how to graphically communicate your results. You were taught how to write a scientific paper if that it was uh, required. And most importantly as well, we have communication and uh, collaboration with practice where there's mentorship programs where you go and present your projects to practices here in Copenhagen and they give you feedback from the practice perspective. Our studio culture is crucial. We have many uh, um, nationalities represented and the fact that it's a very tight-knit group that share their knowledge has given uh, incredible results. We love to publish. We just published the second uh, book on uh, the Amazon and it's available in the library and obviously also to exhibit, uh, which is a way, of, again, of controlling and communicating your work. Next year, our focus is on the East African Rift and we'll be going to Tanzania. Dealing with uh, health issues, we'll be traveling from the coast, Zanzibar, Dar es Salaam, uh, Serengeti, Kilimanjaro and the depths of Tanzania to deal with many of its challenges. Tanzania ranks number 154, uh, fifth, uh, first in 188 countries, and uh, that means that there's a lot to do, especially when, do according to the WHO, the top 10 causes of death, three of them are linked to housing, literally lower respiratory infections, diarrheal diseases and malaria are linked literally to architecture. How can architecture make a difference? We are lucky that Jacob Knudsen is engaged in projects and research uh, in a huge uh, funding uh, pool from WHO to the B uh, Belinda and Gates Foundation in engaging and testing new architectural formats that we'll be visiting. We have a huge problem in the uh, developed and uh, large cities with regards to how they treat, and actually they don't treat liquid wastes. This is the same city, just on the other side of the fence. How you're building for new residences, uh, almost as a copy-paste of the West, misunderstanding its climatologic conditions, how can you as an architect make a difference? And how can you also give a chance to the rural communities to develop new energy resources instead of building uh, and burning their own? How tourism is an asset, but it's also destroying many of its uh, um, local um, uh, flora and fauna. And how imports and exports are impacting literally their landscape. These are all the mines dealing with aluminium and gold. Gold is extracted in large amounts. It is their main export worldwide. But at the same time, it is extracted by hand. This means that about 20 tons of mercury are annually released to the environment in Tanzania because they extract the earth that they burn in fire, use mercury to separate gold, and the mercury literally goes up in the air. Huge energy extractions are being developed, and uh, uh, large areas of Tanzania have now become available for that impact. How does this impact architecture, and how can you, by looking very close at this context, draw assets and make a difference. Knowledge that can then be used everywhere else. So as a last thing that I want to say, if you burn to engage with the world of challenges, uh, to explore how architecture can be proactive instead of a passive resource user, to collaborate with other disciplines and researchers towards a site-specific architecture, and to critically work with technology and performance while investigating new artistic expressions, I hope you consider us. Thank you very much.